emptiness. It's a central concept in the Buddha Dharma. What we're going to do in today's uh, video is to look at this concept, the concept of emptiness in Buddhism, in particular at its early history. I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute. That's onlinedharma.org. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to the channel. And if you click the bell down below, you'll receive notifications when I come out with new videos. Also, if you'd like a deeper dive into some of the topics of early Buddhist Dharma, check out my courses over at onlinedharma.org. So what is emptiness and what does it mean? That's going to be the topic of this video. Now, uh, most importantly, I think uh, emptiness is really the central topic of Dharma within Mahayana Buddhism, which is a, a later school of Buddhism that, that, that arose out of the early Buddhist Dharma that we generally discuss here on this channel. And I'll be using, I should say, a, a book uh, by Mun Kit Chung, who's a, a scholar who's done a lot of comparative work between uh, the Pali and the Chinese redactions of these early texts that we uh, uh, rely upon to know what the Buddha taught. Uh, he has a book about emptiness in early Buddhism, and this is what we're going to, you know, this is going to help us to, to give the foundation for what we'll be talking about today. So in any event, in the Mahayana, this, uh, this topic of emptiness is, is central. It's central to the Dharma. Um, but uh, there are some differences. Uh, in, in particular, in early Buddhism, it's less central. And this difference between the two emphases uh, in early Buddhism and later on in the Mahayana is reflected in certain differences we find in uh, redactions of these early texts. We'll, we'll get to that eventually. Uh, but it's important to stress that uh, although uh, emptiness is extremely important in later Buddhism. It becomes really the, the major point of Buddhist Dharma. It is original to the Buddha. The Buddha did discuss it uh, originally in the early texts, and that's what will be the, the, the most of what we'll be talking about today. Now, the great uh, scholar and translator Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, discusses this uh, emptiness within the context of early Buddhism and asks, where the Buddha might have come up with this idea of the concept of emptiness, where, where it might have arisen from. And he uh, suggests, uh, which I think is, is a very interesting suggestion, that the Buddha may have been responding to certain ideas that were around him at the time, in particular ideas coming from uh, the Upanishads. Now, the Upanishads are a group of, of texts, originally oral trans transmissions, uh, that were uh, constructed, composed by Brahminic seers, Brahminic forest renunciants who would go off into the forest and, or by themselves and in small groups and attempt to discover new ways to interpret the Vedas and disco discover new ways to uh, interpret their own place on earth. Basically, they were, they were sort of like forest philosophers in a certain way. And uh, they came up with these Upanishads, these texts, these ideas, uh, that really revolutionized uh, the way that the Vedas were interpreted uh, among a certain group of people at the time. And these, these uh, ways then influenced the Buddha's own ideas. And there's one particular passage in one of the early Upanishads, which seems to have been around the time the Buddha uh, was teaching, or at least before he was teaching, so he, would have, he might have heard of it. It's called the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. And in that Upanishad we read, we read, that is full, this is full, from fullness, fullness arises. Having taken fullness away from fullness, what remains is fullness. And this, this passage is clearly uh, somewhat obscure. It's going to take some unpacking to try to understand. But the basic idea here that we, that we have in the Upanishads in general is this idea that uh, our own uh, eternal soul, uh, everlasting soul um, is identical with this with Brahman, which is this universal principle, like a, a deified universal principle that underlies all of reality. And this fullness, which is this this Brahman, this eternal principle, uh, is the sort of thing that lies behind our perception of the world, that lies behind the manifest reality that surrounds us. So we see uh, tables and chairs and people and houses and trees, but in fact all of this is simply a manifestation of this fullness that is Brahman. This is the interpretation that we might get in the Upanishads. And so as we uh, 
in the Upanishadic idea, as we become uh, awakened, as we reach towards escape, which is the, 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 the point of one's practice within that tradition, as we reach this kind of uh, escape, this moksha, this kind of uh, uh, the equivalent of nirvana within that tradition, what we're, what we're doing is getting behind the manifest reality. So as we're sort of piercing through this fullness that is, that is this uh, manifest reality, we're getting to the true, the deeper fullness from which our fullness arises. So in the Upanishads, we have this idea of the immortal soul, which is who we are, and this kind of uh, eternal reality that lies beneath a fleeting world of appearances around us, and that these two are in fact the same thing. That the fullness that is us and the fullness that is reality, this is the same fullness. That's the idea. And the Buddha would indeed uh, argue against this kind of view. He did not believe this was the correct way to view things. In particular, the Buddha didn't believe in an eternal or unchanging self or soul uh, underneath everything that, we, that somehow was who we were. Instead, the Buddha had quite a different view, which we'll get to in a bit. But uh, Mun Ki Chung suggests in his book that, that emptiness may also have originally, in the Buddha's idea, been a kind of a, a metaphor or a statement about our tendency within meditation to retire from the world, to seclude ourselves from the world, from, from worldliness, from the lay life, from the ordinary householder life. That was what it was to become a monastic, a renunciant. And so to be empty in that sense was to be empty of the ordinary cares of daily life. And in that sense, we might say that all meditation is a kind of emptiness meditation because all of our meditation practice involves a kind of renunciation, a kind of seclusion from the world, a kind of emptying out of our mind from the ordinary concerns that, 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 that plague us during our daily life. And also in a deeper sense, uh, meditation is intended to empty us out of our more unskillful types of mental states, our states of greed, of hatred, and of delusion or ignorance. And in that sense, emptiness, in again, in early Buddhism, had this connotation of emptying our minds out of that which is uh, less than skillful, out of that which is uh, unethical in certain uh, circumstances. And this also points, uh, I think, eventually to the idea that Nirvana, that awakening, is itself identified with a kind of emptiness. Uh, nirvana itself means extinguishing, as in the extinguishing of a candle flame. And there we get this, I think, uh, rough connotation of emptiness, of emptiness of that flame that, would have, that, that was continuing before, that we have gotten, gone beyond greed and hatred and ignorance, that we have gone beyond uh, certain kinds of causal chains which, 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 bi which bound us in the past. And in one of the early texts, Ananda, who was the Buddha's attendant, asks the Buddha what it means to say that the world is empty. And this is, of course, the, the idea, the, the question that really uh, we're, we're wondering about in this video, I think. What does it mean to say that the world is empty? And the Buddha responds that what that means is that the world is empty of a self or what belongs to a self. And in the Chinese uh, recension of this particular sutta, it adds, or I should say clarifies this a little bit, explains a little bit, that what this means is that it's empty of any kind of eternal or permanent self. That is to say that, that whatever, our, whatever we are is something that's always changing. Um, there's no part of us that continues uh, from mo even from moment to moment. There are only sort of rough similarities that are causally uh, linked to each other over time, uh, causally conditioned, shall we say. The later our, 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 the, the way that we are right now is causally conditioned by the way we were in the past, but that self that we are changes all the time. There's nothing permanent there that we can point to as who we really are. And similarly, we have to say that uh, nothing belongs to such a self that is permanent either. So nothing in the world, uh, since there is no permanent self t for things to belong to, nothing can belong to them. And similarly, uh, there's nothing permanent in the world either that, could, uh, that also could ground our sense of self. And indeed, in the early texts, the Buddha doesn't typically say that things are empty. Now, there are a few 
uh, uh, exceptions to this, but in general the Buddha doesn't talk about things being empty. What he talks about is things being empty of self. And indeed it seems in the early texts that that's what it means, uh, to be empty of self. And uh, we can go further on this and say that in the early texts there's this idea of reality being uh, typified by three characteristics, uh, the three ways that the world is. Uh, first of all, the world is typified by change. Change is everywhere. Everything we look at is always changing, even in, if, even if, if in very, very subtle ways. That's number one. The second is that the, the reality is in some sense unsatisfactory. Uh, the, the Pali word is dukkha, which is often translated as uh, suffering. But that may be too uh, strong in certain circumstances. The, the general idea is that even happy and positive and pleasant states are suffering in this sense, are unsatisfactory because they're going to come to an end. That's the second. And the third characteristic of reality is that reality is non-self. It's selfless. It doesn't have any permanent self that is unchanging. Any self that we have an idea of is a sort of a construct that we uh, make of, a f of our fleeting selves and then we'll find that that construct uh, becomes falsified after a short period of time because we change. Okay, so these are the three characteristics of reality in the early texts, uh, at least in the Pali tradition, because as Mun Ki Chung uh, uh, note, points out, actually in the Chinese recensions of these very same texts, a fourth term is added. And so it's not that reality has three characteristics, it's rather that reality has four characteristics. And the fourth characteristic, you won't be surprised to hear, is emptiness. So that reality therefore is a change, it's changeable, it's, it's always changing, it's unsatisfactory, it's empty, and it's non-self. Chung, however, argues that in these phrases where emptiness is added to the three characteristics, essentially emptiness doesn't mean anything more than non-self. That is to say, the, the addition of that extra term, that extra term of emptiness in this, in this uh, phrase of three to, to four characteristics, doesn't really add anything. It seems redundant in this, in this phrase. It's not adding anything new. It's simply a, a reaffirmation of non-self. And so this is the critical point here, is that in early Buddhism, Emptiness means non-self. It means that we, are, uh, we don't have a permanent, unchanging nature to who we are. And that nothing, we don't have anything that belongs to such a nature either. And the Chinese recensions, the Chinese versions of these texts, also mark a slightly closer relationship between dependent arising and emptiness than we find in the Pali texts. Uh, now, dependent arising is a, a complex kind of topic. I did an earlier video on it. I'll put a link to it down below in the show notes in case you haven't seen that and want to learn more. I, it's too big a topic for me to go into here, but in, in a nutshell, the basic idea is that uh, the Buddha pr proposed a middle way in between what we might term or what he termed eternalism and nihilism. Uh, that is to say, that some people believe in his day that all things exist, that all things are essentially eternal, that they're unchanging in some fundamental sense. We just saw that with the case of Brahman with the, the Upanishadic Brahmins. Uh, the other idea is nihilism, that somehow nothing exists, that all things that we see are, are illusions. And the Buddha rejected both of these and proposed uh, a philosophy by what he called the middle way. In, in particular in a, a famous sutta to Kachayana. And in this text, what he meant by the middle way is what he called dependent arising. That is to say that, that whatever exists is brought into being by causes and conditions, by dependencies on other things. And then those things go out of existence and other things replace them. It's in a sense a, a philosophy of constant change, of, of flow, um, as uh, some Western philosophers might put it in, in ancient Greece, that they talked about the, the, the river that we couldn't uh, step into twice because it was always changing. This is the same idea here. So it's not that all things exist in some fundamental way or this fullness that we discussed earlier, and it's not that nothing exists. 
but it's rather that things come into and go out of existence continually by law-like kinds of relations, by causes and conditions. And the uh, dependent origination is a theory of exactly, or, or some of those causes and conditions, we might say. And there are various uh, discourses, suttas in the early texts, where the Buddha discusses this in various different respects. And in one of those, uh, in, in several of them that are related in the Chinese, but one in particular that Mun Kit Chung discusses, it's mentioned that this is, in the Chinese phrase, uh, the Dharma discourse of great emptiness. In other words, this discourse is considered a discourse on emptiness in the Chinese. However, the Pali uh, versions of these texts don't have that, don't have that additional sentence. They, they don't call them the discourse on emptiness. So we might wonder, why is there a difference between these recensions? Why is there a difference between the Pali recension, which is, the Pali is, uh, I should make clear, is an Indo-European language. It's perhaps the language the Buddha himself spoke, uh, arguably, or at least a language that was spoken in India at the time, related to Sanskrit. Uh, and the, why is there a difference between that, those recensions, and the ones that were, uh, we find in Chinese? Well, the ones in Chinese were translated out of probably Sanskritic versions of these texts, that is not out of the Pali directly, but out of other texts that were around at the time, translated out of them sometime around the 5th century of the Common Era. So quite a long time after the uh, original text might have been written down, which would have been sometime maybe 1st century before the Common Era or something around there, it's hard to say. Um, so there was a long, uh, long period in between here. And what happened in between these periods, the writing down of the Pali or the equivalents, and the writing down of the Chinese? In between here, of course this is speculative on my part, but uh, let's just go with it for now. In between here we have the arising of what's called the Prajna Paramita Sutras, which are the sutras of uh, the perfection of wisdom. And if you want to hear more about those, a little bit in their role in the Mahayana, I have a link, I'll, I'll leave a link down below to the history of the Mahayana where I discuss these a little bit. But in any event, it's in those sutras, the sutras on Prajnaparamita, on the perfection of wisdom, that we first find emptiness becoming a really big deal in Buddhist philosophy. Uh, emptiness really is the sort of the heart of, those, of that approach. Because the, it's said, the basic, basically, that the perfection of wisdom revolves around emptiness. And then, in the 2nd and 3rd centuries of the Common Era, I should say that the Prajnaparamita Sutras were composed sometime in between the 1st century before the Common Era into the 1st centuries of the Common Era for a, a while there. So it was during that time that we have this kind of ferment of these new ideas and new interpretations. And that kind of flourished, in particular, in the person of uh, Nagarjuna, who is probably the, the most famous Buddhist philosopher after the Buddha himself. And Nagarjuna's uh, uh, really uh, important uh, reinterpretation of the Buddha Dharma, again, also very specifically revolved around notions of emptiness. Uh, he used emptiness uh, very, very uh, critically and, uh, and, uh, and often, to describe what he saw as the heart of the Buddha Dharma. So that was again the 2nd and 3rd centuries of the Common Era. Now, so if we think of a timeline, we think of the Pali material perhaps being written down in the 1st century before the Common Era, then we have this flourishing idea of emptiness as being central to the Buddha Dharma, and then in the 5th century of the Common Era, so uh, maybe 600 years, 700 years after these, or this early material, was, was written down, we have the translations into Chinese. The other key point to make here is that the, uh, the, the Prajnaparamita Sutras and the influence of Nagarjuna was much greater in what's called the northern tradition of Buddhism, which would have flourished uh, more or less in northern India. And that, it was from the northern tradition that we have the flourishing of the Mahayana in general, we have the flourishing of uh, I should say we have the flourishing of material that goes to China. So it's from that tradition that we get the, the transmission into China, into Chinese, and eventually into uh, Japan and Korea. Whereas in the southern tradition, the Prajnaparamita Sutras and, and Nagarjuna, that was not as, uh, 
important that really did not have much of an impact at all, at least directly, on the southern tradition, which is what then what what ended up in Sri Lanka and then into Southeast Asia, which we know now today as the Theravada, which is what preserved the Pali tradition. So because of these historical developments, we don't find emptiness as really a central practice or approach to the Dharma within uh, either the early Buddhist material, as we've seen it, it really hadn't flourished yet in the early material, and we don't find it today so much in contemporary Theravada, whereas it does flourish later and then into the Mahayana. Uh, now, we might wonder, and I think it's important to, to wonder, how to put this material into practice, because that's really where the rubber hits the road. And there are, I think, a couple of different ways we can go. First of all, as we've already said, uh, in a sense, all meditation practice is a kind of emptiness practice, because all of meditation involves emptying our minds of the ordinary cares of daily life, emptying our minds of ordinary greed and hatred and delusion that weighs us down, that makes our lives difficult. However, the Buddha also recommended a, an actual meditation on emptiness, which is quite uh, deep and detailed and subtle. And I have a video that will be coming out uh, next week on that very topic. If you're watching this uh, later, I will put a link to it up here on the screen. You can watch it right now uh, because I think it's really an important next step. If you haven't, it's not up yet, just I'll put something else up here for the, in the meanwhile. So I uh, hope that's been useful. Thanks so much to all of my patrons over on Patreon. Hope to catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you be well.